All right. Welcome back to another episode of I'm Free Now What? Um, my name is Michelle Fortier. I'm a licensed clinical social worker in the state of Florida. And today on today's topic, I have my friend, I always call her Webb. I'm sure she has a real first name named Sean, but I know her as Webb and she knows me as 48. So if I start saying Webb, it's the one that's labeled Sean, but her name is always be Webb to me. <laughs> we met in the prison system. She was another social worker and another mental health professional that also worked with clients. Now I have her on today's show um, because of everything that's going on in the world, especially in the United States, let's not say the world, in the United States, with everything that's happening with the police, with the murders of people by the police, all the stresses, all the trauma, all that other stuff. I have, um, I'm gonna just keep calling you Miss Webb. I'm sorry, I'm, I can't help it. I have Miss Webb on to speak on that because I don't feel like it's my place. I feel like I'm gonna bring in an expert on this topic and that is going to be Miss Webb and she's gonna be talking about how to cope in this type of environment so that way you can stay sane and uh, continue on to fight another battle because I don't know if this is gonna end anytime soon. All right, Miss Webb. Well, I first of all, thank it. you, 48, for inviting me on. I'm super excited. And yeah, my name is Sean, but you can call me Webb, whatever. I'm one of the homegirls. So um, basically, I've gotten so many phone calls just this week about um, just several incidents going on right now, especially this last one with all the rioting and everything. And I know it's like for black and brown people, we're tired. We're just tired of seeing it. It's the same thing over and over and over. Um, it seems like nobody is listening to us. Nobody hears our side of the story. And you know, there's a question that needs to be asked at the most highest level. Why is it that uh, when it comes to black and brown people and we're unarmed, we get shot in the back or shot period, but we can see Caucasian people or European people just acting the plum fool and they get taken in peacefully. So that's a, that's an issue to me. So, you know, I was having conversations with people today and I was like, why are we not having multicultural and diversity training amongst the police forces? Because to me, you need to learn how to deal with different cultures. You're going to be dealing with different cultures while you're out there on the street. So why is that not mandatory? Why do you not have to have so many hours of that before you can go on the streets and start policing people? Because if you already have this preconceived notion of this culture or, or this population of people, then you're not going to go into it with open eyes. Or, or you're already going to have this preconceived notion. So you're already on the defense mode when you're dealing with these different cultures. So to me, that's, I, th I think that's mostly what's going on. These police officers are not trained um, in that sector, so they don't know how to deal with us. They see us as a threat before they even get to know us or before they even encounter a, us. So there needs to be some training um, as far as how to deal with different cultures when you're interacting with them. Um, but as far as coping, I know for myself, I just try to stay informed. I think that's the best way to, that we could cope because you have so many different news outlets out there. Like you got Fox, you have CNN. Some of them don't tell the truth, let's be honest. So you have to do your own research. You have to stay on top of the facts and just deal with it for what it is. So for me, I cope by, you know, going to MSNBC, CNN, uh, BBC, um, just different outlets, just getting as much information as I can about it. And then I actually try to look up some of the laws and see, you know, what can be done because I'm more of an advocate. I like to advocate for different things. So, um, yeah, you get angry about stuff. It's okay to get angry, but, you know, it's not okay to be out like looting and doing crazy stuff because that's just going to get you a case and, you know, that, that's not going to solve anything. I think this is the time for people to be out in droves, um, marching and, and that sort of stuff, but just being safe about it. You know, don't, the violence part you can do without because that's just, just going to cause more trouble. But I think the numbers of people, and what I'm really surprised to see is the number of Caucasian people who have just joined in, like they're tired of it too. It's like, finally, it's not just our fight. Somebody else is tired of it too. So 
Yeah, when you're talking about coping, you know, it's it's a lot of things that you can do as far as uh, coping, but it's it's kind of hard when you're a part of that population. If you know you're a part of that black or brown population, you still have to drive around in certain neighborhoods. You still have to think about this. You got to think about possibly getting pulled over. Or this could be you or one of your loved ones next week, tomorrow, whenever. So it's kind of hard because when you see stuff like that, the first emotion is anger. Mm -hmm. So then you have to think, okay, how do I process this anger? What do I do with this anger? And for me, I don't want to just get angry and do nothing. Or I don't want to get angry and just do something that's pointless. I want to channel my anger into finding answers uh, to the problem. So, you know, my thing is just seeing what I can do to help the situation. I think what we really need right now is a, is a mouthpiece. We need someone that's um, well known amongst brown and black people who can speak on our behalf. They can go up and talk to the politicians. They could be on the talk shows. They could be on the radio shows. They could be on the news outlets and they could be, you know, talking on our behalf. So I think that's what's really needed. And, and I said today, it could be like a, a spiritual figure, maybe like a Jamal Bryant, Bishop Jamal Bryant, uh, someone like President o former President Obama, someone who has tact. You know, we don't need people going up to all gangster because then they're not going to really listen to what you have to say. But we need people who can professionally articulate our needs, our concerns, you know, what, what we want to see done. So one of the things that really made me really happy about the situation was the mayor, uh, Jacob Fry, he was very quick in his response. He said, no, this is unacceptable. I'm not understanding why there's not an arrest. You know, something needs to be done. And I think that's the only reason why something was done as quickly as it was, because after he spoke up, then they were fired. And then um, charges was brought against the one that uh, actually committed the crime today. So, you know, when you have people in these platforms, they can't be afraid to speak up. No matter if you're a part of that population or not, you don't have to be black or brown to have a heart or to care about something. So I really feel like because he spoke up on it was the reason it was immediately dealt with. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and that helps us to cope too, to see that, hey, it's somebody that's not black or brown, but they get it. He got it. He was like, no, this is unacceptable. And I could sympathize, you know, with that, just the fact that he put himself, you know, in our shoes for just a couple of seconds. It was like, no, you know, this is unacceptable. We need to do something. So now, I heard you, sorry, I heard you say taking the anger and putting it and channeling it into a positive way. What kind of recommendations do you have for some of the people that might be watching about how they can do that? Conversations. Conversations are always good. I mean, get together with people in your neighborhood, your family members, talk about it, like have a round table uh, discussion about it and everybody, you know, speak their piece on it. And, and you, you could come up with ways, you know, you don't have to be educated to advocate for something. You could come up with ways like, what do you think would help the situation? You know, everybody put your head together collectively and try to figure it out, you know? Just conversations, even having conversations with people you work with, because I work with a lot of people who aren't black or brown. And, you know, just this week, we've had conversations about it and people was like, wow, well, I didn't know you felt like that. You know, so, yeah, conversations need to be had. You wouldn't know how a person feels about something unless you conversed about it. So, you know, that communication piece is very important. Mm -hmm. just to get things out you know you can't bottle it in you know the more you bottle something in it's more like you're gonna snap at some point so you got to have that soapbox somebody you could call and say hey you know this whole situation is just getting on my nerve you even if they can't offer up suggestions they can listen and that's so what i'm hearing you say you is find people that'll listen to you find people that'll listen right. to you non-judgmentally and be supportive right and not make excuses for, for people's maladaptive behaviors. That's one of the things that really irks me because uh, just this week I've heard, well, uh, he had to be doing something. Um, they wouldn't have just done that. But then when the, the video came out and it showed that the man clearly was already handcuffed and he was not resisting, so there was no reason for them to do, do that. I'm like, hey, let's not make excuses for the person that's committing the bad behavior. That's number one. Let's not make excuses for that. Yeah. 
You know, we just need to, I think this is a time where America really needs to see people come together regardless of race or ethnicity or any of that. You, humankind has to be first. You, you, the human factor has to be first. And so now how do you recommend that people deal with all the sadness that comes along too? Because basically one of the, we watch somebody on TV get murdered. Right. Anybody with any sense is going to have some sadness surrounding that. And I watched uh, CNN last night where the young man and the 17 year old girl who actually taped it, um, they had conversations with them and they were saying like they can't sleep at night after seeing that so upfront and personal. And yeah. I was just thinking, you know, I saw it on the video on TV and it kind of like messed with my sleep pattern that night. When I saw it, I was like restless. So, yeah. you know, that, that is something, you know, you have to just pros and cons, just write down the pros, write down your cons, you know, stuff that, that good CBT, um, you know, even so, solution focused. You know, that's my favorite. Oh, yeah, I know you love your SFT. I, I love solution focus, yes. So that's my favorite. You know, like, what's the preferred future? What would you like to see going forward, you know, um, when instances like this happen? What would you like to see? And how can you be a part of of getting that? How can you be a part of, of what you want to see, making that happen? Um, and, I, and I think that's what we have to do. Um, I was very kind of like sad, depressed about it when I first saw it, because I was like, man, the guy wasn't even doing anything. And then to hear that it was about possible fraud, I'm like, okay, but that's not a violent crime. So for somebody to die for something that wasn't even a violent crime, I was just like, yeah, this is just beyond me. So, you know, when you're talking about coping, there's a lot of things that you can do, especially with the depression piece. You, first of all, staying busy, um, keeping your mind focused on um, other things. I wouldn't say like not trying to look at or not trying to um, stay abreast of what's happening because that's important. We need to know what's happening. We need to know what's going on with it, but don't let it consume you. Like it shouldn't be what you do every day, all day. Like it shouldn't take over your whole life. Mm -hmm. Like you have to, at some point, find other things throughout the day to do to kind of get your mind off of it. But then at the same time, you know, you do need to be thinking about it because it affects you. So you do need to be trying to say, hey, what can I do to fix this situation? And I think what we have right now in America is a lot of people with a lot of complaints, but uh, those same people aren't offering up any solutions. So you just complaining, 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 and of course that's not helping. Mm -mm. So for every complaint you have, you might want to come up with at least two solutions to fixing the problem. We this is a collective thing. I've heard people all week long say this is local; it needs to be handled. No, this is a national issue. It's happening in every state. It's national, mm -hmm. and I think Congress should not leave this to local entities to fix. Mm -mm. They need to intervene. But what's interesting to me, not but, but this is something else is, um, don't forget to help at your local level too. People, sometimes they feel so frozen because the problem seems so big. But like Webb just said, is this is happening, these issues happen everywhere. It's just right now that, you know, Minneapolis is on the news. Right. That's it. So it's where people feel frozen that they can't be that big, but you can do these things and fix these things in your Locally. local area. Right. I just made a Facebook post last week and I told them your local vote is just as important as your pres presidential vote. And your local vote is important because these are your judges. These are your judges. Like, okay, these are the people that are sentencing people or letting people go. So, I mean, you need to be writing your local congressmen and your local uh, people in, in charge there locally. You need to be writing them, letting them know because we put them there. Mm -hmm. And I tell people all the time, they laugh at me because even you know this. I say, well, let me call um, Congressman Austin. Um, <laughs> yeah, Scott, you know, um, be, do I not say it? You they say it all the time. Any, anytime I'm going to get mad, uh-uh, no, I'm going to go call my congressperson. So and there's Webb in her office. Do, 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 do. Yep. 
<laughs> yep, she know me very well. I'm telling you, because my thing is, if I take the time to vote you in, you gonna work for the for those dollars that you send up there getting. I'm gonna make sure you work. Mm -hmm. they know me by heart if, if they see my number they answer hey miss Webb." they already know if, if it's an issue um you fixing to fix it because i voted for you you're not just gonna sit up and collect the paycheck and that's mm -hmm. the thing that we need to get out of stop elect electing people and then when there's a problem you sit back and do nothing you don't you don't um knock get on their doors involved right mm -hmm. you got local people here who can take this stuff up to washington dc or it's up to Atlanta. That's what they're there for. They're supposed to get the concerns of the citizen and then they go up and lobby. Yeah. Yeah. And and there's also the sheriff. Sheriffs are elected. Yep. The sheriff all is elected. elected people. Yeah, all of these elected people are the people that we need to be tapping into saying, hey, before something happens like this in our city, what can we do? You yeah. don't have to wait until somebody dies. You see it's mm -hmm. happening all over. So that's one thing that you could do to cope right there. Yeah. Get involved in your own community and say, hey, this is happening and I just want to know what can we do collectively to be proactive before something like this happens in our city. We want to be prepared. Yeah. So what can we do to prevent this? And that'd be where the diversity trainings come in. Yes, yes. And because to, to be honest, like I even um, told them, like with military, when I was in the military, we had multicultural diversity training just because you may uh, deploy and go somewhere else. So you need to know their customs, you need to know their values, their norms, or whatever else. Shaking hands in America is perceived as polite, but over in China or Japan or, or wherever, they don't shake hands, they bow. Well, there's so no shaking need, hands in America if you got any sense anymore. Right. <laughs> That's true. That is true. We better start picking up some ballad. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm just saying, you know, there's a lot of things to be done. And it's, it's, it's time out for people to just like, well, woe is me. I can't do anything about it. No, you could do your voice count, your vote counts, your opinion counts, you count, you matter. I tell people Black Lives Matter, all lives matter. I mean, you know, it's true all lives matter but when you look at the, the situation it's black lives that are that are being you know adversely affected right now the mm -hmm. most if you just want to be honest yeah so it is what it is but you know there's a lot of things that you can do to cope and i think one of the biggest things to cope is get involved once you're involved you don't have time to be depressed you don't have time to be angry because you're solution focused. You're thinking on a, a solution. How are we going to fix this problem? Mm -hmm. What are we doing to fix this problem? So that is the number one thing you could do. Get involved. I think one of the things is to also remember this is a we problem, not an right. I problem. So right, when people exactly. start thinking, I, 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 I need to do something. No, it's a we. It's a we problem. Because if people make it an eye problem, the problem is way too big. It's insurmountable. There's right. too much to do. But when we tap into each other and we become united together and we work towards this common goal, it's a we problem. That means every once in a while you can go take a break and go to sleep. You don't got to right. shoulder the whole burden by yourself. Because somebody else got it. Yeah. I said this today. We need to mobilize. I said this yesterday. I said until we mobilize, nothing is going to be done we we have to all be on the same page you can't have this group over here trying to fight this battle but this group over here trying to fight this battle no everybody need to come together and we need to fight one thing at a time we need to all come together and fight one thing at a time once we conquer that okay what's next mm -hmm. right now we got too many people fighting too many things and it's just it's confusing mm -hmm. and nobody's together and you're correct. That's part of mental health is you get a list, you get your goals and you meet each goal. You don't try to hit every goal all at once. You get lost. No. You prioritize. You say, first things first, I need this. And you start with the little Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Yep. You have the bottom shelter and safety. That's your number one goal. All the rest of that stuff as you move up. Great. Grand. You get there eventually, but you got to meet those bottom things first. Yep, this is one of those things where you got to pick your battle. Which one of these 
is the most important right now. And right now, the most important is Black Lives. So yeah. everybody needs to be on Black Lives yeah. right now. The people stay alive that Black people are not murdered. Right. So, I mean, that's especially in our community, we can't seem to, first of all, agree. And then secondly, we can't stay together. Like, we'll, we'll, we'll have large numbers starting out, and then two weeks later, it just started dwindling. And people are like, oh, yeah, I got to go back to work now. Yep. And so somebody asked me today, just today, somebody asked me, they was like, what do you think is the difference between um, back when there was a Martin Luther King and a Malcolm X, and now I said that's simple. That's simple. I said back then nobody cared about losing their jobs, nobody cared about dying. They was like, I I just refuse to live like this. So you gonna have to kill me because I'm not dealing with it no more. So it was just like kill me. I, I I would die for this cause. And I was like, we don't have that today. People are scared mm -hmm. of losing their jobs, uh, let alone scared of losing their lives. So you don't have anybody that's willing to stand up and say, okay, I'm willing to die for this cause. So so my grandchild or my child doesn't have to go through this. Back then, they didn't care. They, they knew they could be killed. Yep. That was but kind of the, the whole thing is you would be killed. You And you have to be okay with the fact that you're right. going to be killed. Right. I mean, killed. that was a must. That, that was, look, that was the topic of every meeting, uh, you know, look around because the person you sit next to might not be here next week. I mean, it is what it is, mm -hmm. but they did it. So we can have the freedoms that we have today, but we don't have those type of leaders today. Yeah. And that is the problem. That's the problem. The leaders today are worried about their jobs. They're worried about their lives, their livelihood. Um, you know, they, you know what I mean, and to me, the, the, the thing that really upsets me the most is all these um, spiritual leaders. Like at these mega churches, black and white, y'all have a platform. You got like two, three, four, five thousand members at your church. So you mean to tell me the churches can't get together and do something? And that's. The, the think about it that was Martin Luther King was churches Malcolm X he was Islam it's it's these things have generally come out of a religious background a lot of the big movements came out of a religious background but we don't have that today the mm -hmm. churches are like I don't want no parts of that I'm gonna stay out of that we just gonna operate within these four walls and I wonder no. how much of that has to do with their involvement in the political system. Because it used to be back in the day that churches didn't have all this political sway. But yeah, it was separation of church and state. Mm -hmm. there was a, so, yeah. Now there's a lot more of where they're playing games with the, with the politicians. Yeah. So that's, I, I mean, I, that, that puzzles me because I, I was thinking about that. I was like, you know, back in the day, churches were very involved like they would have town hall meetings at the church mm -hmm. everything happened at the church whatever meeting there was for black it happened at the church it don't matter if it had anything to do with church or not if it was a meeting concerning blacks and them getting their freedoms or whatever they had to do it happened at the church mm -hmm. you don't have that today mm -mm. so that's one of the biggest downfalls too so what else do you think people can do to help cope with all of this that we talked about coping with the anger with the depression now we have fear how do fear. we cope? how can you how can people cope with fear and it's legitimate now, fear it's not like it's not legitimate fear it's legitimate fear yeah now with that that's going to come with educating yourself um you know just educating yourself on how to interact with the police like if you get pulled over you know um you know have your 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 belongings somewhere where you don't have to reach under the seat or out of their sight to get it i was thinking about that um last week because i you know where i keep my stuff you know where i keep my stuff at and i was thinking like mm, if i get pulled over and i have to do all this reaching that you know they could think i'm reaching for a gun you know i thought about it and i was like you know what i need to start riding with my stuff on the dashboard so my hands are in plain sight 
you know, when I'm reaching to get this stuff when they're asking me for it. So it's stuff like that that we shouldn't have to think about. But if you want to mm -hmm. stay alive, I mean, yeah. it's a part of that fear factor. You have to be proactive in how you're going to deal and interact with the police because you never know. Mm -hmm. You never know. It, it could be a nice police officer, but then again, it could be a butthole. You just never know. Yeah. So you you know, you have a right to fear. Like you said, you have a right to fear, but then there's that education piece too. You need to educate yourself, do things that will, you know, help in keeping you safe. And I'm not saying like, if you have your, your wallet or whatever on the dashboard, they're not going to shoot you. They could still shoot you, but it's less likely than you having to reach under the seat or behind you or something like that, where yeah. they might get jumpy and think you're reaching for something. So you know, to combat fear, I think you should have a spirituality piece. You know, I don't, if you don't believe in God or whatever, you know, most everybody believe in a higher power, power other than themselves. So whatever that is for you, you know, that, that's something you can tap into too, um, to combat that fear. Yeah. And education, you know, you just have to educate yourself. You have to educate yourself, you know, what is the best way for me to try to remain safe? You know, that's that's like mostly the only two things you can do right now. Have a spirituality piece in there. Educate yourself and, you know, and just try. I tell everybody, comply. I, I don't understand how people in this day and age just stand up and argue and curse the police officers out like they have guns. You talking, they can shoot you dead. So my thing is, try your best to comply. Just do whatever they say. Don't argue back. You know, just do what they're telling you to do. Nine times out of ten, hopefully, if you're doing what they're asking you to do, you won't get killed. But we just saw a situation where yeah, that didn't even happen. And that's the thing. That's why Webb and I, we work together. And one of the things is both of us, we want the world to be a different way than it is. But we also recognize the world is the way that it is. And so both of us always prepped people for the way yeah. that it is always looking to make this world better. So in no way, shape or form are either one of us saying that the way that you have to keep your license up there is the way that it needs to be. This is the way that it is and it's wrong. At the same time, we prepare for the world the way that it is, not the way that we want it to be. Because we don't live in, a, we, we can't live in a magic land where just because we blink our eyes, all of a sudden life is there. You know, police don't kill people. We, it's not like that. So right. unfortunately, we have to live in reality, even though it's wrong, it sucks. But we always have to remember, my favorite thing I do DBT is always effective. Our behaviors need to be effective. So we can't be willful. And we can't just sit on our hands. We have to be effective in our behaviors. Do what's going to get the job done. Right. And get out of the situation as quickly as possible and, and hope for the best. Because my thing is, I'm trying to live to tell the story. Like if something happened to me, I, you know me. If I make it out of it, oh, everybody is about to know. You already know. Everybody is about oh, know. to know. It's, it's, it will be well known if something happened to me and I make it. Now, the only way you might not know if, if, if I don't make it out of the situation, but if they crazy enough to let me get out of the situation, mm -mm. I, I'm not going to let it go. What was it? Brown I mean, said, somebody's got to go and tell the story. Somebody's got right. to live to tell the story. got to live to tell the story. We can't all <laughs> die. Somebody has to live to tell the story. And that's what I always say. When you're faced with those type of situations, your first uh, mindset should be, survival survival make it out because nobody will probably ever know what happened to you if you don't make it out and it's just so happened like in this day and age everybody's recording stuff so that's a good thing because this is behavior that's been going on forever we just didn't know because you know people probably didn't have cell phones and all that when all this first started but now that we have all this technology now it's up and close and it's in our face and people are being forced to deal with it and people are being forced to do something about it. Because I can guarantee you, if there was no video of that, that would have been a he say, she say. And if you would have had just black eyewitnesses, they probably wouldn't even got charged, mm -hmm. to be honest. But no. because there were videos, they couldn't dispute that. Mm -mm. 
the guy, the police officer, I think he had two other um, killings in the line of duty. Well, I heard today that um, he, there were nine other complaints against him, mm -hmm. and um, they said that they never went anywhere. Mm -mm. He had nine complaints against him for misuse of force. Yep, and he had they, Native American guy got killed, and another black guy got killed. So, and I wouldn't be surprised if Internal Affairs or the FBI don't do the same thing they did um, in Brunswick, Georgia, with the the man the young man that was jogging or whatever you know they went through and they fired like a number of people in that police department so i wouldn't be surprised if that same thing doesn't happen here when that once they do their internal investigation if a lot of other people uh don't get fired but but, but my thing is why does somebody have to die before they can go in and do an internal investigation that's crazy it is nobody should have to die for that to happen Mm -hmm. so yeah there's a lot of things that we need to be advocating for but like i said we need to mobilize first and um i think our first um action should be the lives lost unnecessarily and these people don't even have weapons mm -mm. and then just here in tallahassee i don't know if you've seen it but um i think yesterday or the day before yesterday uh a young lady got shot and killed by the police mm -hmm. so i'm just like i don't know the backstory with it that's a messy one Appa yeah, apparently so. that individual right there had been incarcerated a couple times and you know how they would always say i'm not coming back to prison the police are going to kill me before yeah. i come back that was a suicide by cop oh okay, okay that's what it's looking like so far you know looking at all the the information and what's coming out uh, apparently that person i think did a facebook live where they were saying that and they had stabbed somebody the day before or something i'm not uh, up on the particulars of the case but it from right now what the information is looking like from the victim themselves is that it's a suicide by cop mental health okay, issues yeah, see, and see and that's when i'll be you know seeing those type things i like to kind of like wait a couple of days to see because you know the real story starts coming out that way i can research it a little more yeah. and see what uh, goes on with it because I don't like to take social media word for stuff, you know, sometimes eyewitnesses are not the best resource. Mm -mm. But I really do think, I, I think that there's going to come a time where the the land will heal. And you know, I'm a very spir spiritual person. So, you mm. know, I always quote Bible scriptures and I always try to, until, you know, I get pissed off and forget about that. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I put, your down, girl, put your foot down, 48. Put your foot down. Right. Kuta, when you get a cut off. But <laughs> Brock would come down the hall. That's how Kuta Kinti got it cut off. <laughs> right. But, you know, I just seriously think that there's going to come a time where God will heal our land, but we have to do what the word says. We have to acknowledge him and turn from our wicked ways. And I think that's what the problem is. We've had so much wickedness going on and people have just forgotten about, hey, God is in charge of this. I'm just going to do what I want to do. And so now God is showing you, you know, with all this stuff that's going on now, he's showing us, hey, I'm in charge. So if you don't want to acknowledge me, I'll let this stuff happen to where you won't have any choice but to acknowledge me and turn from your wicked ways and do what I asked you to do. And I think that's what's going on uh, here now. Um, I think there's just a lack of love. I know it's it not corny. It is. It's just, you know, it's just a lack of wanting to even hear, wanting to hear the what anybody else has to say and appreciate their pain and try and, and it's alleviate that pain. It's very unfortunate too because um the thing that I, I really don't like about it is the is the um divisiveness. Like we have somebody in office right now who is just very divisive and I don't like it because I'm like, I get along with everybody. I don't care if you're black, blue, purple, gold, or green. I like everybody. So, you know, and I think everybody has something to bring to the table. Mm -hmm. I love like just sitting at the table talking to people who are different from me because I learn a lot of different uh, things from them. We can learn a lot from each other if we're willing to listen. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem. Nobody wants to listen. Everybody thinks they're right. Mm -hmm. 
We and they want to stick group everybody group. in a box. They right. want to say, you're either going to do this way or not. No. That's not and what, what they don't understand is what works for your culture might not work for this culture over here. They got different stuff going on. like, And that's what I'm saying. Where is the culture sensitivity? Even with this COVID, even with this COVID nineteen, I was looking at um, a special um, a couple of days ago, and they were saying that the Indians are the most hit in this COVID nineteen. And I was like, I didn't even think about that, but they're out there on those reservations. They can't socially distance because they they live in right. Well, there's each also. Other. I'll hook you up with some resources because I follow a bunch of different um, uh, American Indian Facebook pages and groups. And they would post a lot about what's occurring in their communities. Cause you know me, I'm some, I like to stay up in everybody's business. So, and I, I you know. I was surprised, yeah. Cause I didn't even think about that. And I was like, see, it's that's the, the poverty. I know if I wasn't thinking about it, a whole bunch of other people, they just not thinking about them cause mm -hmm. they out there on the reservation. They're not seen. Mm -mm. And it's the poverty. It's the absolute abject poverty. And there's issues back and forth between because the way that Native Americans are supposed to like they're viewed is that it's very paternalistic. The federal government takes takes care of them. So there's difficulty getting medical supply. Like there's there's a whole bunch of systemic problems that has allowed this problem to occur. And because there's such a marginalized group, like you're saying, like most people aren't aware and a lot of people don't give a fuck. Yeah, Excuse yeah. the French, but I mean, how else do you describe it? Yeah, and that was the first thing I said. I was like, when I saw that, um, I immediately like flipped back to it. And I was like, you know what? I bet this, you know, they just forgotten, forgotten. Because mm -hmm. I didn't even think, I have to be honest. I didn't even think about them when, when this first, this COVID first popped off. I thought nothing about Native Americans out there on the reservations. But it makes plenty of sense. They have lack of, of of good food supplies, medication, even testing. Ain't nobody's going out to the reservation to test. No people. PPE. There's lack of PPE. There's there's it, it's 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 insane. It's absolutely. And this is something else too. Is that you know that whole like you have to have a driver's you have to have an address on your driver's license. Can't have a PO box. That affected the um, reservations because a lot of the reservations don't have street addresses. So they would have IDs with PO boxes. So then they were trying to say that they don't have ID that's good enough to vote with because they don't have a street address on it. Anything Just another to way to disenfranchise. Yeah, any way to suppress a vote. And then I, <laughs> I even went even further. Why, when there's a national pandemic, why is it not a rule that every state participate in mail-out ballots? That's crazy to me. There's a national pandemic where you telling us we need to socially distance, but some states, you got people at the polling places. Every state should be doing mail out ballots right now. It only makes sense. It That's only crazy. makes sense. And that need to be a rule. That need to be something that social workers advocate for too. Uh, during the national pandemic, every state needs uh, uh, mail out ballots that's crazy I, I'm so I sure gonna, we gotta get our shit together i'm telling you i saw a line in one of those states i can't remember but it was up north somewhere and the line was like out the door and nobody was six feet apart and i was like oh this mm -mm. is a death trap and they did they got some covid going on from those those vote the from voting i'm pretty sure they did they decided the that crowd and the first thing i said was why are they not doing mail-in ballots? Why are people even going to the polls? I was, to be honest, I was surprised Georgia did it because you know we. <laughs> hey, I got this in the mail today. What you talking about, Florida? What? I'm saying I did. I sent mine in two weeks ago. I cannot even. What? That's what Florida? I'm saying. Georgia and Florida would have been the last two states. I I'm telling you. But you see that foolishness they got with Florida going on with the, the uh, convicted felons rights to vote yes. again. DeSantis is bringing that back up into the courts. You can't, I can't even, I can't even. But listen, it's on our ballot. 
this year on the Georgia ballot is they're asking the question should convicted um, felons be able to vote immediately after serving their time I voted yeah they don't serve their time pretty much but we voted the same thing in Florida we said yes when they're done with their supervision when they're done being involved with the court with their their crime give them the right to vote they have held that up in court forever but that's that's for another topic. That's another time. I'm trying to get you on the other channel so that way we can talk about that stuff on the other channel. Okay. This is the mental health. Well, mental health, yes, people, is very important. I I used to always say your mental health is just as important as your physical health, and I really wholeheartedly believe that. Yeah. Um, because if you could be physically fine and you have a mental health breakdown, that's going to affect your physical health. So you need to be, you know keeping up with your mental health, be healthy with that, you know, anything you can do to stay happy, uh, not depressed, uh, not fearful, all that kind of stuff just causes all kind of anxieties and ulcers and all that. So your mm -hmm. mental health, you know, it could cause physical issues. So you really want to stay on top of that. Yeah. Really do want to stay on top of that. There's a lot of things you can do. Meditations, mm -hmm. um, what was the one I used to like to tell the inmates to do all the time for anxiety? The oh, breathing man. exercises and the muscle relaxation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really yes, works. It really works. It really yeah. works. Especially in all this stress with all this trauma going on. And that's one of the things too. Like I do a lot of trauma work. I'm a trauma therapist. I, I work with trauma. And one of the things that people need to do and recognize is that we need to you need to be moving you have to be walking you have to do something yep. as you're processing all this trauma you have to move your endorphins endorphins, endorphins. and you also mm -hmm. have to burn off all those stress hormones you have to burn off that adrenaline and there's also this weird thing that happens in storing trauma if you're moving after or during the trauma you actually reduce the trauma that being stored it does something with your brain something kind of cool something kind of weird but it actually helps you process that trauma so it doesn't become ptsd so that's why like when people get into car accidents and they're stuck they're more likely to develop ptsd than people that are able to move afterwards it's like this whole and big thing know, so people need to walk you know what a, a really big one is sleep hygiene too what a lot of people don't think about mm -hmm. your sleep hygiene is highly important Mm -hmm. getting enough sleep at night um you know finding a good place to sleep you know where you won't toss and turn you know you don't want to be restless um mm -hmm. you know you're getting up tired every night from being restless sleep hygiene is important like are there certain foods you, sh you shouldn't eat like right before you try to go to bed because they'll keep you up like caffeine and stuff like that um mm -hmm. you know it's just a lot of things that you little small things that you can do Mm -hmm. um, that'll, that'll really help you out. Sleep hygiene is really, really important. Mm -hmm. Until you get two or three restless nights, you just be in a bad mood all the rest of the week. Mm -hmm. And that increases depression and anxiety, which is something that, you know, the world's throwing a whole bunch of stuff at everybody and it's impacting your community very, very, very much. And so, yep we got to keep moving forward though we can't let these assholes beat us down and this is what i like to tell people too why the hell are you staying up all night worrying about some shit that you can't even change anyway that's the serenity prayer like okay if you know that there's nothing physically you can do to change the situation take your ass to sleep let it there's go there's no reason for you to be up worrying mm -hmm. about it you can't change it go to sleep mm -hmm. That's a whole worry time. I have a whole video on worry time. You put those worries to worry time. And then you can worry to your heart's content for 15 minutes. And then at the end of that 15 minutes, you let it go to the next time. Next day, 15 minutes. Worry about all the stuff you can't control. Right. Because I was like, that's the craziest thing. Like, I hear people say that all the time. I was up all night thinking about such and such. They went to jail. We don't have the money to get them out. I'm like, well, if you don't have the money to get them out, go to sleep. You stand up <laughs> you staying up does not put money in. go to sleep no go to sleep. no like you said web and i we're very reality based i am we're, we're very reality i am we're, we're both like this is the issue this is the pro like there's no point in stressing about this right now 
let's put this on the back Listen, shelf. We we ain't got time for this. My my mom and I had a conversation last year because my son um he had moved in here with my mom and my dad. Well, my mom can't go to sleep until he get in the house. Well, that he nineteen, almost twenty. He was eighteen then. And she was like, you know, calling me at one o'clock in the morning asking, had I talked to him? I was like, no, I'm asleep. And then she was like, well, I, you not worried about me? I said, he 18. I know who I raised. So I know he ain't out there doing nothing crazy. I said, so no, I'm supposed to go to sleep. Exactly. And she, would legit, she would legit stay up to two, three o'clock, whatever time he get in, just so she'll know he home safe. And I told her, I said, so what's the difference? If something happened to him while you awake, you're not gonna know it until the people call you and tell you. So if you asleep, what's the difference? Yeah. Go to sleep. Go to sleep. I'm right there with you. All right, well, do you have any last words? Any last little loved, bits of advice? I've thoroughly enjoyed being on. Uh, I hope I get to do it again. But if you don't remember anything else that I've said, just take the time to take deep breaths. You know, nothing is really that serious. Some things are, you know, but really, really just take care of yourself. Self-care is a real thing. Like take care of yourself and all that's going on right now. There's, you know, there's nothing that we can immediately do about th these situations, but in time, we're going to get our shit together. We're going to mobilize like we should, and we're going to, produce the change that needs to be produced but you know in the meanwhile don't let it consume you don't let it take you over you no. know you still gotta live you still have to live this is not a sprint this is a marathon that that and the marathon continues that's nipsey hustle what you know about that <laughs> come on that's nipsey come hustle on. That's who are you talking to <laughs> the marathon continues <laughs> yes. Come on, who I, used to, well, yeah, what, did, I, what did I used to sing down the hallway? Come on. <laughs> yeah, I forgot you like our music. <laughs> I'll talk to you later, Web. All right. All right. All right. Bye. Bye. Hold on. I just hit stop recording. Uh oh. <laughs>